Thank you so much to those of you who watched our first episode of Climate Crisis, Our Changing World. We have had some great response to it and so many of you have asked questions and that's what this online series is all about answering those questions clearly with our knowledge and our analysis of the science and in conversation with experts. And one question we're often asked is what is a climate emergency? What does it mean? Well, in May last year, the UK Parliament declared a national climate emergency. And in declaring a climate emergency, our government has admitted that global warming exists and agreed to take action. But what is causing the warming? What is the emergency? For that, we need to understand the basics. So let's start at the beginning. First of all, this is Earth. It's our world and it holds everything, every animal, every plant, every human, and it's actually very fragile. And for this world to be perfect, we need balance. The Earth gets all of its energy from the sun and it warms up the Earth. The Earth then heats up and radiates all of that back into space. And if everything that comes in, the same as everything that goes back out, we're balanced and the temperature on Earth won't change. But if the heat that comes in isn't all the same that escapes, if some of it is trapped, then that is when we become unbalanced. And when we're unbalanced, that is when we start to warm. So what is trapping the heat? Some people say, hasn't the world been hotter than this before? Isn't this just part of a natural cycle? We get warmer and we get colder. Well, yes and no, the Earth has been warmer than this before but we have never warmed so quickly. So let's take a look at all of the things that can impact the temperature here on Earth. Now, these graphs are going to show how the temperature on Earth has been rising and rising in the last 150 years or so, but more especially in the last decade or two. Let's look at the impacts on the global temperature, just looking at the sun alone, the impacts of the sun and its orbit, negligible effect. How about volcanic activity? Well, again, this shows very little impact. Deforestation alone slightly cools the planet as the bare oil absorbs the heat, but the trees are the lungs of our planet and they absorb carbon dioxide. So overall, all of the natural factors cause very little impact. But how about humans starting with ozone pollution? This makes the climate a little hotter. Aerosols cool things down, but unfortunately also causes acid rain. But finally, greenhouse gases, the yellow trace there a huge rise and actually carbon dioxide emissions have risen 40% since 1750. And it's this rise in greenhouse gases that almost exactly matches the observed rise in temperature here on Earth. So it is undeniable that human-made greenhouse gases are causing the temperature to rise. Why? Because the gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, trap in all of the heat. And this year it was at a record level 2.6 in the highest we've seen in 2.6 million years. And it's just like a glass roof of a greenhouse. But what are all of the impacts? To understand more, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Doug McNeil from the UK Met Office about the climate science and how it affects us here on Earth. Wherever we look at the Earth system, we see the impacts of a warming world. Uh, so if we look on the land, uh, we see extremes, uh, extremes in temperature, uh, extreme warm days and extreme war warm nights. We see many more of those. Uh, if we look in the oceans, uh, we see a warming ocean. As the uh, ocean warms, the ocean expands and we see a, a rising sea levels. If we look in the, in the cryosphere, in the cold places on the planet, uh, then we see uh, melting ice. So we're losing uh, sea ice. We're seeing melting of glaciers and we're seeing melting of the large ice sheets. Uh, so the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. Those also contribute to, to, to sea level rise quite considerably. Uh, if we look in the hydrosphere, so the water cycle, uh, we see, we know that the atmosphere, as it warms, it can hold more water. And that means that we'll get more extreme rainfall and extreme precipitation. Uh, and if, and, and the, the thing to understand is that the more warming there is, uh, the higher the risks are of all of these happening. But what about the impacts of climate change here in the UK? Well, here in the UK, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. Uh, in general, we'll expect that to continue. We'll see uh, warmer and, and, and drier summers, and we'll see uh, milder uh, and wetter winters. Um, so that means that in the summer, we'll be vulnerable to more extreme temperatures. We'll see more records and record-breaking temperatures. Uh, and in the winter, we, uh, we might see more intense rainfall and more flooding. 
Uh, and in the UK as well, we're, we're quite vulnerable. We've got a long coastline and we're quite vulnerable to sea level rise. So that will require quite a lot of adaptation over the next few years because sea level rise is, is one of the things that we know is going to continue happening uh, almost whatever we do about climate change. And what other impacts are we seeing? So with the changes in, in the water cycle, for example, uh, we see uh, a tendency towards more and more intense drought. Uh, and that can, have lots, uh, that can cause lots of problems. So that can cause uh, failure of crop harvests, and that's got quite severe impacts on food security. And it can cause things like wildfire in forests. So uh, the, the wildfires that we saw in the US and in Australia last year, uh, we expect those to, uh, to become more intense and to be, become more frequent uh, as the world warms. Wildfires were the biggest headline news before COVID at the start of this year. Australia experienced their worst bushfire season in history. And annual fires are nothing new in Australia, but they have become more intense and destructive in recent years, a problem that has been fuelled by climate change. A couple of months ago, South America was also victim to extensive wildfires as the Southern Hemisphere experienced their harshest heat wave in history. Parts of Brazil, Bolivia and Paraguay have been ablaze for months with the worst wildfires in decades, not only destroying the homes of thousands of endangered and unusual species, but also the livelihoods of many of the diverse indigenous population. In the Northern Hemisphere, parts of the US also had their most prolific wildfires on record. More than 4 million acres of California was lost to fire. Excess heat is the biggest catalyst of dry, hot, arid conditions rather than lack of rain. Scientists have found that the chances of extreme weather that triggered the wildfires have increased by more than 30 per cent since 1900 and that fire conditions like this are four times more likely. Smoke can travel hundreds of thousands of miles. The smoke from the California fires travelled as far as Europe earlier this year. Smoke means more pollution and the likelihood of respiratory problems and potentially more so for those with long-term health issues following contracting COVID. So there's a lot to take in and a lot to think about. We all need to do our bit with many companies referring to being carbon neutral and net zero, words I'm hearing all the time. But what does this actually mean? Alex has more. You're right, Lucy, we're going to be hearing a lot more about carbon neutral and net zero in the near future and over the coming decades. And that's because the UK government have pledged for us to be net zero by the year 2050. And carbon neutral and net zero, well, they pretty much mean the same thing. And I think it's important for us to know that when a product, service or business state that they're carbon neutral or net zero, we actually know what it means. They're basically offsetting their CO2 emissions. One of the easiest ways to explain this is to say, take an airline company. Now each flight does produce carbon dioxide, which is left in the atmosphere. But if that airline company is able to work out the amount of emissions produced by that flight, well, they can offset that by say planting trees and trees through photosynthesis are able to extract that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it below the ground in say soil. So that flight produces carbon dioxide. It's offset by planting trees, which basically brings that company or that flight rather back to neutral. The ultimate goal is carbon zero. And for that to happen, let's say take the plane, well, it would have to be fully electric, only powered by renewable energy sources. But we'd have to go one step further or rather one step back. The manufacturing process of building that plane would also have to involve zero carbon. So it's actually quite a tough task, but hey, not completely impossible. It's not just, say, car manufacturers or airliners which have to be more environmentally friendly. We all can do our bit. Later in the programme, I'm going to be talking to the chairman of Forest Green Rovers Football Club, who are the world's first certified carbon neutral football club. Back to you, Laura. Oh, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that, Alex. Now, tackling climate change is something that ITV are committed to, and we have pledged to become net zero by 2030. We want to create the biggest shows with the smallest footprints, and this last month, six of us and other media global giants signed a climate media pact to tackle climate change. 
It has been a crazy year of weather. So much has happened and we've missed so much, including COP26, which actually should have been last month. But Lucy, what is COP26? How important is it? And actually, people have still marked the event, haven't they? Yes, this year would have been the 26th year of COP, which stands for Conference of the Parties and is made up of nearly 200 countries. Set out in 1994, it's a global UN summit discussing climate change and how to manage it. And this year it was due to be hosted in Glasgow and it was forecast to be the biggest COP to date. But given lockdown restrictions, it was postponed and rescheduled for 2021, the first to be missed in its history. Many were frustrated by this delay and as a knee-jerk reaction, a wave of young people felt they could come together online to have the annual meeting regardless of their location. It's been a year where many of us have lived our lives through the laptop screen on Zoom and this meant it was an easy option for many. With no travel, it was also environmentally green as well. Known as Mock COP26, 300 young people from 140 countries presented thoughts on many potential policies. And closer to home, the UK government declared 2020 a year of climate action. As well as the targets for changing to electric cars, the government has pledged to reduce UK's carbon emissions to net zero, which means releasing virtually no carbon by 2050. Unlike COP26, Wales Annual Climate Week went ahead as planned and our ITV Wales weather presenter Ruth was very much involved. Hi Ruth, great to see you, albeit through the magic of the TV screen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you were involved in Wales Climate Week this year? Yeah, hi Lucy, absolutely. Well, I think you mentioned it there yourself, pure magic. Of course, uh, we were all supposed to be in Glasgow this year. It didn't happen against the backdrop of COVID. So the Welsh government decided that actually, rather than delay the conversation, we were going to have that conversation and we were going to do it uh, virtually. So such is the way of the modern world. We got together um, a series of digital interactive events, people from all sectors, all walks of life, um, right the way from public sector, private sector, down to school children, policy makers, you name it, everyone got involved. And I uh, was lucky uh, as part of my role at um, ITV Weather um, to be able to host this and effectively to bring everybody together and to ask some really, really challenging questions and some, well, getting some really interesting answers too, Lucy. Well, that was my next question, actually. I know that you've hosted similar kind of events before. Did anyone mark this one as different apart from being virtual? Was there anything new that cropped up that you were quite aware of? Well, actually, I think the putting this into the context of COVID and, of course, we've got Brexit. This was very much about being positive, as positive as we possibly can. So rather than making it very formal and, and talking about policy, it was actually about what people at home can do. One, for example, um, a lady that I've known for a few years now, Sean Sykes, who lives up on Anglesey, she does stand up paddle boarding. And a couple of years ago, Sean decided to paddle board around the coast of Wales. And as she was doing so, was picking up uh, litter from the seas and the oceans. And actually to see what she managed to just drag in onto her little paddle board was just incredible. And people like Sean, you know, doing their bit, their own small thing. But actually when you put people like Sean and everyone else together, you get much, much bigger picture. So making small changes and tweaks can become a habit and this can all make a huge impact. Alex also has been following a story where others are hoping to make a bit more of a difference. Do you know what, Lucy? There's actually quite a lot being done in this area and evidently some are doing more than others. But English Football League team Forest Green Rovers seem to be well, quite a way ahead of the game. They've been going green over the last 10 years I'm going to talk to Del Vince, the chairman who started it all. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, you know, it's a great thing that Forest Green Rovers uh, you know, are doing uh, and it must be a real honour to be you know, the first UN certified carbon neutral football club. Um, tell us uh, how that came about and why you, you, you made the change. Well, it's, it's kind of kind of pleasing to to notch a first uh it always is but at the same time it's a little bit sad isn't it because i'd rather be like you know i'd rather be the last uh three years ago because that would mean that uh an awful lot had been done by other people so to be the first is kind of bittersweet thing you know like nobody else has done it um never mind um how it came about is the UN 
we were talking to them about a uh, sport for climate action program, which they were uh, had just conceived of and they'd seen our work at Forest Green and said, can we talk because you're doing a lot of the stuff that we think needs doing. And uh, so we joined that conversation. And then they said one day to us, look, we've got this uh, climate neutral now program, which uh, we'd like you to take a look at. Uh, it's a three step program, measure your emissions, target them for reduction. Uh, and reduce them as far as you can and then offset the residual amount. And because we already did steps one and two and had been doing them for a long time, we knew how big our residual footprint was. And so it was just really easy for us to offset that and um, complete the uh, carbon neutral now uh, program. So what changes did you make and how easy was it to implement those changes? <clears throat> we, um, we apply like a, a big picture universal uh, rule of thumb or slide rule across everything that we do. And so we applied this to Forest Green. We look at energy, transport, and food, three big sectors of life. 80% of everybody's personal carbon footprint is in these areas where we make choices every day, how we power ourselves, how we travel, and what we eat. And the same blueprint or, or rule of thumb applies to any organization of any size, as well as to people. And of course, a football club is not an is an organization. So we applied that to Forest Green. Uh, we changed the energy that was supplied to the stadium. We put solar panels on one of the rooftops that we made some of our own. Uh, we installed electric car charging points for our fans. This is going back a long time now, 10 years ago. Uh, we we uh, adopted electric vehicles for staff use. Uh, we're waiting for a team bus that we can buy that will be electric. That's not in the world yet, but it's coming. And we changed the menu, which is one of the easiest things that anybody can do. Um, so anybody looking at this saying, you know, how can I get started? I would say introduce a vegan option. Just start there. As I understand it, then it's not just the players that are being fed a vegan diet. It's also the fans when they actually come to the game. I mean, did you have any kickback from that? And, you know, <laughs> how easy was it to do? It was easy to do because we were never not going to do it. It, it was not a question. Uh, kickback, yeah, I would say to a, to a degree. Uh, the first thing we did was take red meat off the menu. The Sun called it the red meat ban, so they dramatized that and gave it lots of airtime. I enjoyed that because it gave us airtime for our message, actually. And we engaged with our fans and explained why we were making that change. Red meat is the worst kind of animal product for the environment and for human health. Uh, and we explained that we were on a journey, actually, and that football is two hours a week per fortnight on average for a home game. And we said to our fans, why don't you come to a game and try something different? Don't come and expect to eat what you eat every other day of the week. So practically, how would that work for you to be zero carbon? Because that is the ultimate goal, really. Yeah. And, you know, it requires a continuing focus on the big three areas of, of impact, energy, transport and food. 80% of all impacts are in there. So it's a, it's a great kind of high level uh, approach. You can, you can then dive deeper into any particular set of that. Um, we've got to tackle single-use plastic. We, we're reducing waste to landfill to zero. It is at zero now. We're composting at the stadium. The, uh, the alternatives to plastic that we use for takeaway food, for example. So it's about uh, in-housing everything that you can, keeping it local, reducing waste, uh, you know, um, which is about being efficient. And you can be efficient in your energy consumption, in your transport and in your food as well. Um, it's, it's about a continual focus to drive down waste and consumption of everything. Thank you, Del. Um, pleasure chatting to you. And, you know, you guys are clearly leading the way on this. And, you know, all praise to you and good luck for the future. You know, you're a shining example. It's so great to see the difference that everyone can make and progress is happening. Last month, the UK government showed the difference that they want to make tackling climate change with their new 10 point plan. I'm joined by Leo Hickman, the editor of Carbon Brief. What is it all about? What are the most important areas where they're trying to cut emissions? Well, the 10 point plan that the government has sort of announced is it's, it's pretty bold and it's quite um, far reaching. So it, it touches on things across our whole economy, our whole levels of lifestyle um, and behavior. 
So, for example, it, it focuses on transport. You know, it wants to see the end of the sale of new petrol and diesel cars, for example. It, it's looking at aviation and shipping. It also looks at the, the way we generate our electricity. It wants to see a quadrupling of offshore wind, for example, by the 2030s. Looking at the way that our, we use our land, farming, the forestry, and it looks at the way that we could potentially draw down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it. It's, it's, it's pretty ambitious, but it needs to be delivered now. That's the key challenge. And how does it rank amongst other countries and their global commitments? Well, in terms of the, 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 the bigger, bolder vision of net zero by the middle of the century, we, we as a country are in, in some ways leading the world and many other countries are now pledging net zero as, as, a, as an ambition. Mm -hmm. But the 10-point plan, in terms of some of the details, it, 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 is, it is a good start. And we've done some great things as a country in terms of, for example, getting off coal. You know, the way we've been reliant on generating electricity through coal, we have made, in just a decade, big, big strides. And many other countries are looking to us to see how we've done that and are trying to do the same. So 2021 really will be a turning point year for the Earth and for climate change. Are you hopeful? I am hopeful and I think 2021 is going to be a big year. We've had a pretty bad 2020, let's <laughs> be honest, but we can come out of that crisis year of the pandemic um, and I think we can use it almost as a springboard. It does feel like something's really changed in the last few months in terms of the, the Biden victory, the Chinese pledge. I think geopolitically it's going to be different and as we head towards COP26, yeah. which is a profoundly important conference. It's probably the biggest international moment for the UK in the last, in the, in the, in, in the generation. You know, other than the Olympics in 2012, this is the one big moment where the world's eyes are all going to be on the UK. It's a big moment of responsibility for the UK. And I think we should, as a country, take that and, and, and really run with it and try to deliver a very, very successful um, UN climate talks at the end of 2021. It's actually quite nice to end on that for the year. So definitely feeling positive and our chance to shine and show the world that we can all do it together. Thank you so much for joining us, Leo, and I'm hopefully we'll join you in the new year and see how things are going. So we end the year with some hope and also a vaccine. 2020 will be a year to remember for many of us for all the wrong reasons, but we have seen some amazing and uplifting stories throughout the pandemic and also from nature with wonderful images of earth healing and many of us reconnecting with the world around us because of course it's the only one we've got and we know it's worth protecting and if we keep working together it looks like it might just be possible. So if you have any questions you'd like us to answer we'll keep you updated throughout the year ahead on climate crisis our changing world.